are some practical ways to engage peers without being dogmatic? I think it is very important to engage in dialogue. Dogmatic claims can be stated as something that is truly believed in your conviction, but it must be justified, not just asserted. Why do I lay claim to what I do with such deep conviction? For example, if somebody asks me, why do I support the Christian worldview? My answer is very simple to them because there are four questions of life, the question of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And when I te test out each one of those in their truth component, I can find answers, biblical answers on origin, meaning, morality, and destiny that conform to reality as I can test it out. And when the four answers are given together, they provide a coherent worldview. So is that a dogmatic belief? Yes, it is believed in the sense of a conviction, but it is defended with grace, undergirded by kindness, and not in a bullish or a mean-spirited way. If truth is not undergirded by love, it makes the possessor of that truth obnoxious, and the dogma he possesses becomes repulsive. So you must hold on to it with compassion and kindness and courtesy, but it must also be defended at the same time. So carry on a dialogue. Don't be afraid of laying claim to truth so long as you have ably defended it and the counter perspective has a challenge to question what you believe. And at that point, you have to unpack it and, uh, and give a response. That's how dialogue actually goes. It's the interaction of logic. It's too two different views coming together, and the dialogical method is the best way. You can present dogmatic truth with love and gentleness without being obnoxious. Sometimes it'll be in kind, sometimes it'll be in word. It must always be with a gracious spirit because the truth unbeautified becomes unattractive and it can be defended well. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next question. How do we profitably discuss hyper-politicized topics such as abortion, marriage, and sexual norms? You know, it's interesting how much culture plays, in, plays into this. In some parts of the world, these are things that will never even be discussed publicly because it will be offensive in certain audiences to even pontificate on those issues. Here, fortunately, in the sense that we have an open culture in which we can talk about these things. My own view is this to the questioner, thank you for asking this, because I think these are the issues that are bringing so much hurt within our culture, so much pain to people, so much uh, rancor, so much uh, offense. And so here's what I say oftentimes when I'm speaking in audiences. I say, look, we will differ in applicational matters we will differ in matters of inference. We will differ in matters of choices all along the way. But it'll always boil down to one question to each of us. What is your starting point? That's what I am interested in. That's the key. Because, you know, some years ago, I was asked to do a lecture at Johns Hopkins on the subject, what does it mean to be human? Uh, Francis Collins and I were representing the Judeo-Christian side of it and all other scholars from different vantage points. And when I began to give, prepare for my talk, it dawned on me how critical that question really is. On the basis of how you've answered the question, what does it mean to be human, all of your other extensions and applications are made. Your application in sexuality, your application in pleasure, your application in truth-telling, in relationships, all of these emerge from the bottom line definition of what you believe it means to be human. For example, if you were to take an automobile and use it to run over another human being. You can't blame the maker of the automobile for, for killing that other human being. The automobile maker will say, that's not the purpose of why I made this car. If you cannot take an instrument and use it for a purpose for which it was not made, and therefore and try to think you can blame the maker of that instrument, how can we really define sexuality, marriage, values, if we don't know the purpose of our lives. 
That, to me, is where we need to be discussing these very carefully. Is life sacred? Is life at its core of intrinsic worth and not extrinsic worth conveyed by state? Uh, and let, me, yeah, let me give you a, a vivid example of this. When I finished a series of talks at Oxford, we were talking on the nature of absolutes. And uh, one young Oxonian came up to the front and he was pretty, pretty articulate in what he said. He said to me, you know, of all the things you've said today, the one thing I really take issue with is the absolute. He said, I don't agree with you that there needs to be an absolute. I said, if you don't talk about an absolute, you're talking about a one-ended stick. I don't even understand, everything is relative. And we went on this road. He said, I don't believe there are absolutes. I said, all right, let me ask you this question. And there were students standing around him, his classmates. I said, I take a one-year-old baby in your presence, and I put that baby on this platform where I'm standing, and take a jagged-edged butcher knife and chop this baby up for my pleasure. Would you believe I have done something bad or something evil? I kid you not, he paused. He went like this with his shoe, toe, and then he looked at me and said, you know, Mr. Zacharias, I wouldn't like what you did but I cannot honestly tell you you would have done something evil. And all of his classmates standing around him went, whoa. You see, when you start from the premise that everything is of pragmatic value and nothing of essential value, you veer off into the distance with nothing remaining sacred anymore. What is it in the Ten Commandments that really summar are summarized in one word? Your body is sacred, your life is sacred, your possessions are sacred, your marriage is sacred, your, your word is sacred, your time is sacred, and so is your neighbors. You don't violate that. So if you ask me how we talk on these things, I think it is the wrong starting point. We have to start with the foundation, and a best illustration is in the University of Ohio, when I was being driven there to my lecture, you go past the Wexner Center of the Arts. And the man driving me said, that's the first of America's first postmodern building. I said, what's a postmodern building? He said, it has no purpose. <laughs> there are really no designs. There are stairways that go nowhere. There are rooms that are of odd shape. It has no, he said, and the architect said, if life itself has no purpose, why should our buildings have any purpose? He said, what do you think? I said, I have one question for that architect. Did he do that with the foundation as well? <laughs> City Hall would never give you the permission to build a foundation with no purpose. The foundation has to have a purpose. So in all of these discussions, you have to start from the foundation. What does it mean to be human? Is life sacred or desacralized? On those two edifices, you build the rest of the infrastructure. Otherwise, you've got your feet firmly planted in midair, and you can't stand on that. Okay. How do you explain the tragedies caused by the proliferation of Christian beliefs, like the Crusades? Well, part of what my story is, is that I was raised Muslim. I was raised a uh, very, very devout Muslim growing up. My family taught me to believe in everything that Islam taught. My mother is actually the daughter of a Muslim missionary. She was born in Indonesia, though she was from Pakistan, because her father spent his whole life preaching Islam in Indonesia. That's how devout our Islamic heritage and upbringing was. Now, one thing that I noticed when I was being introduced to the theology of Christianity that struck me tremendously as a Muslim was just how powerful this idea is that God himself was willing to lower himself to become a human, to suffer at the hands of men, and then die for their sake. Now, I just stopped and I thought about this for a second. This is the gospel message. This is the center. This is the crux of the Christian claims. That God, who deserves everything, who deserves to be worshipped by all creation, that God doesn't lord it over people. He's not a tyrant that demands that we jump through hoops so that he can be happy with us when we die and hopefully he let us into heaven. You know, in Islam, the soteriology, uh, we, we had in Urdu, we called it gunna and suwab. It's a, there's a, an idea of blessings and of sin, and you have to outweigh 
your sin with your blessings in order to get into heaven. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, you have to have more good deeds than bad in order to get into heaven. And so for me growing up, the idea was simple. If I sinned, I needed to do more good in order to outdo that. I shouldn't sin, but you know, if I run a stop sign, stop at the next one twice, you know? Just kind of <laughs> counteract your sin and you'll be okay at the end of the day. That's, that's how I was raised. But constantly what I was thinking was, did I pray my prayers? Did I, did I do the fast right? Did I accidentally swallow some water when I was in the shower? When you're fasting, you're not allowed to drink any water at all. Did I accidentally swallow some water when I'm in the shower? Because if I did, that's a sin. I broke my fast. And I'm worried constantly all the time. Have I committed some tragic mistake? When I was introduced to this idea of Christianity, it was mind-blowing. Because here's what it is. God knows that you're going to sin against Him. God knows that you have sinned against Him. I don't need to convince anyone that they've sinned. All I have to do is ask someone, do you believe that you have lived up to your standards, to your own standards? Forget anyone else's standards. Have you lived up to your own standards? And everyone I've asked that question to has said, no. And here's the beauty of the Christian message, that God loves you anyway. And he doesn't just love you in a, in a sense of, oh, I'll let you be and I, I accept you for who you are. God loves you so much that he's willing to die for you. That is the message of Christianity. What did Christ do? He gives this message of the, of the good Samaritan. This is in the book of Luke. He talks about a Jew and a Samaritan. These are two uh, uh, polar opposites in their culture insofar as one did not have meals with the other, one did not care for the other, and yet Jesus, a Jew himself, upheld in this story the, the ideals of a Samaritan who's willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of his enemy. And not just did Jesus share that story, he then lived it out for as Christian theology tells us, he was willing to die for our sakes, even when we were his enemies. Understand this for just one moment. The Christian theology is teaching us that God, who created the heavens and the earth, who is due all glory and all fame and all honor, was willing to be born as a child to two children themselves, and then to be bearing the ignominy of being an illegitimate child why? Why? And as he grows up as an, as an illegitimate child, what is he doing? He's working with his hands as a carpenter, the lowest of low, a tecton. Why? Why does he choose this? What was his lineage? His lineage was one that had prostitutes in it. His lineage was one that had idolaters in it. Why? As he goes and as he suffers at the hands of those who are flogging him, the people that he had poured his life into for three years all fled. They all betrayed him. What is Jesus teaching? He didn't have to do any of this, by the way. According to Christian theology, he didn't have to do any of this. He could have come as a prince. He could have come as a king. He could have come and lorded himself over people, but he did not. Why? Jesus is showing that he empathizes with our lowness, with our meekness with our traits that people would look at us and spit upon us for, Jesus empathizes with that. And he willingly takes it upon himself. And then he suffers for the sake of his enemies. That is the Christian message. Jesus tells us as he's dying on the cross, killed by those he's dying for, he says to us, through, through what he's already taught us, he says, as I do for you, as I have loved you, Go and love one another. That is the true Christian message. And I don't care what anyone comes with. Other than that message, it's not the message of Jesus. There is no suffering that can be justified by that message of Jesus. There's no tragedy, no crime, no genocide that can be justified with a message that says, die for your enemies. Be willing to die for them. This is the most peaceful message there is. This is the most self-sacrificial message there is. That's the message of the gospel. So when people hijack, when people hijack the name Christianity and commit atrocities in that name, don't confuse the name with the gospel message itself. And what we're standing here for today is that, is the gospel message. We're not here to excuse the actions of those who committed tragedies. Yes, there are Christians throughout history who've done horrible things. And if I'm the first one to apologize for that, please, sincerely, I apologize that this was done in the name of my God. But that is not the message of my God. 
We are to lay down ourselves for the sake of anyone who disagrees with us. And when it comes to tolerance, when it comes to tolerance, that is, I think, the most ultimate embodiment of tolerance. Not only do you hear what your enemy has to say or what someone who disagrees with you has to say, not only do you hear that and nod and smile, you actually come alongside them. And after your disagreement, you sacrifice yourself for their sake. That is the most tolerant message that there could possibly be. And that is true Christianity. Let me just present two counterpoints here from the philosophical side of it. The first point is this. Whenever a question like this is raised, notice what is implicit in the question. Two things are implicit in the question. Number one, that human life has value. Human life has worth. How does naturalism give you that worth? Where does it come from? You cannot give intrinsic worth naturalistically. There has to be that transcendent value implicit in the human life. So the question actually posits an assumption that naturalism cannot really give to itself. Yeah, let, me, let me give you a little illustration of this. When I was, uh, I'm, I'm writing a book right now with my colleague from Oxford on why suffering, why pain. And uh, I was watching a BBC production. It's a beautiful, beautiful production on polar bears. And uh, I was just watching it so beautifully unfold and the polar bear comes out of hibernation and has to feed its cubs. It gets onto the ice, but the ice is not as thick. It's taking longer to get to its prey. It comes to a pack of walruses, sets its eyes on the weakest of them, the baby one, and is about to pounce on it, but the other walruses come up to defend. A fight ensues. The polar bear doesn't win it out, and the walruses protect their little one. The polar bear turns around and walks away. And the last scene is the polar bear digging a grave for itself. It's not going to make it. And the BBC commentator, who had done a brilliant job so far, now goes into this. Why did it take so long for the polar bear to get to its prey? Because of global warming. And so we go on this big talk. Let's assume everything he said is right. What is he implying? He didn't for a moment question why this polar bear was being mean and looking at a tiny little walrus when if its own little cubs were attacked, boy, it would draw blood. But that's not a moral question. That's, it's truly in that predatorial animalistic setting. That's the, the misery of each is supposed to make up the good of all. And so you see it happen. Why did he lay moral responsibility to only one entity? That was a human being. We cannot seem to escape the fact that we are not mere animals. We have something that transcends animal instinct. We have a moral consciousness. So the assumptions of a question like this, A, give implicit worth to humanity. Secondly, that we have moral responsibility, neither of which can come from a naturalistic framework. So it has to come from a tra transcendent framework. Number two, never ever judge a philosophy by its abuse. Never ever judge a philosophy by its abuse. Take the integral claims of the philosophy, measure it against its claims, then critique it. If you abuse that philo philosophy and that critique, then you ultimately end up really judging something that it is not purporting to be. That's why uh, Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all other forms of government. <laughs> and what he was trying to tell us is, freedom is a privilege. But if freedom is abused, then you end up destroying the structure completely. So A, it assumes essential worth. B, it assumes moral responsibility, neither of which come from naturalism. C, you do not judge a philosophy by its abuse. That's why state religions have committed so much of heinous acts because politics got wedded to the theology and the same depraved condition moved into a palace and used its power to dictate its will upon others. The true belief of the Christian comes from the freedom of the will and the freedom of choice. Jesus never forced his belief on anyone. We live in a day where we can learn from those atrocious and terrible mistakes. And you know what? Those of us who see the abuse of groups of people like that, we should do everything in our power to take the message of Jesus and the love of Jesus to bring healing and restoration.
How do you explain the difference between the need for shame and intolerance? Isn't a system of shame inherently intolerant? That's a great question, by the way. Really a good question. Uh, and the reason I say it is because I was born in a culture where shame is really used <clears throat> as a constant motivator to perform more. <clears throat> when I was not doing well <clears throat> in my school and was interested more in becoming a cricketer than getting any intellectual prowess of that sort, my dad would just lambaste me or I'd get, I'd get the worst kinds of thrashings. And the line he used on me one day which ultimately broke my spirit when he said, you are going to bring shame to this family. And I think what we often do is use shame in order to hurt people. And that's really not what I'm talking about when I talk about the sense of shame as a warning. <clears throat> uh, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Great Divorce, talks about it. He said, shame is like a hot drink. You can steadily drink it right down to the dregs, but you do anything else with it and it'll scald you. Shame is a personal corrector within your heart and mind where something wrong has been done, not for society to hurl its insults on you. They are two completely different things. But look at it this way. Psychiatrists are talking about a morning after drug after, uh, for people with post-traumatic stress disorder. I know we've got uh, veterans here and those who've been on the front lines. When I was in my mid-twenties, I went to Vietnam. I was not prepared to see what I saw. I was a youngster. I was a student of theology. I was working with the chaplains. Many, many times after that, for weeks, I would be thinking back of the sights I saw on the side of the road. It traumatized me. The first night I came to Singapore, the free country, after, I was, after speaking in Vietnam for four months, going all the way to the demilitarized zone and seeing all that was going on, I was a single young man. I'll never forget walking for one or two hours that night, just wishing almost I could slip that head and just let the memories of it out because I didn't want to go back with that. And those of you who fought and the front lines and so on, I just met a young man here who was in, in Afghanistan and so on. We need to pray for them because the memories of these things take their toll. Here's the point. So doctors are dealing with this, how to deal with this medicationally. One of the fears of finding a medication to help those with legitimate stress and the disorder that comes. What if a rapist or a murderer does the same thing, rapes and murders, and goes and buys a pill and pops it the morning after with no remorse or no sense of feeling of wrong or shame whatsoever? What then happens to our society? So the same thing that benefits in a legitimate stressful situation can be used in an illegitimate situation by people perpetrating wrong and doing violence for violence's sake. What I therefore boil it down to is this. In my heart and in your heart, where lines have been crossed that are wrong, I believe it's God's way of reminding you and me that what happened there was not right. And the more you work that away and make that which was illegitimate legitimized, you move more and more towards becoming a monster without any remorse of any kind. So I'm really not talking about a cultural imposition upon a person. I'm talking about the personal realization that wrong has been done. How do I defend the Bible? How would Jesus respond? It seems unfair to send people to hell. For two evenings, Ravi Zacharias answers hard-hitting questions from a student-packed auditorium at the University of Illinois in a series that's described as live, dynamic, and essential. Order your copy of the University of Illinois Q&A for just $15 by calling 1-800-705-7729. Hello, friends. This is Ravi Zacharias. If you have looked at any tourist magazine over the last 20 or 30 years, you'll recognize what's behind me. This is the beautiful opera hall here in Sydney, and it's right by the waters. It's Sydney, Australia, of course. It's a magnificent setting. The temperatures are really comfortable. They are coming out of their winter just now, and uh, they've done uh, moderately well for their cricketing season, 
<clears throat> so we don't discuss that too much. I'm here with my colleagues. We finished a weekend in Melbourne, Australia with City Life Church. Mark Connors, the senior pastor. About two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was there when he extended the invitation to come back. And so I returned with Michael Ramsden. And folks, it was a magnificent set of meetings for the three days. Uh, I began on Saturday afternoon and did two on Sunday morning for their services. Michael did three evenings, Saturday evening, Sunday evening, and Monday evening. Michael did it combined with a Q&A time and open forum. And on the last day, he actually had our colleague from Australia, Dan Patterson, join him. It is not easy to fully communicate how powerful these meetings have been to see so many of them respond to the invitation, to see the robust services, the music, the young people, so many different different ethnic groups. I believe the church has over 105, uh, or about 105 ethnic uh, groups in that congregation in about four or five different venues. By the time I left there on Monday morning, and uh, leaving Michael there to do the Monday night, I just felt so deeply moved and once again convinced the Lord is really, really using this team. With all that goes on to the negative in culture, there's so much of positive as well. People are coming, people are hungry. I was surrounded by so many Indians, Malaysians, Sri Lankans uh, asking their questions, and Michael was there late every night, long after his talk was over. Then from there, we've flown into Sydney, as I'm recording this, it's a few hours before speaking to Christian leadership and some from government over a luncheon and a very private gathering dealing with issues that face society that we face in society today. And then the day after that on Friday, I go to Brisbane to speak at one of the venues of Hillsong and return to Sydney to speak on Saturday evening and two services on Sunday at Hillsong Church in Sydney. Sydney is, uh, has about a quarter of the entire population of Australia. And I was told that about 35% of the households have some language other than English as their native tongue and what they use at home. So can you imagine the mix of people? They're all here in countries like Australia. And of course, if you go into Canada and other parts of the world, you see the same even in Europe. RZIM is here for such a time as this to minister to people with the cultural conflicts, with the questions of the heart and mind. This is the most thrilling thing to me as one who has led this organization for so many years, to see the younger one coming up the ranks and knowing we can hand the baton on at the right time. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Please keep us in both of those areas of your life. We need you and we are grateful for you. Blessings on you. Let My People Think is a listener-supported television ministry and is furnished by Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia.